Hey, Lucy, are you able to hear that? The background music? Uh, I can't hear the background music. I can hear you, though. Oh. That's a bummer. Playing right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't hear that. Let me see if I change this to. Can you hear it now? No, I don't hear it. Oh. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Hughes. We'll get started in about five minutes. We'll let uh, um, other people to join us. And for now, if you'd like, a uh, good time to check email, check uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, and we will get rocking and rolling on how to track and measure employee training results. D, do you have a question? If you have a question, there's a Q and E, uh, Q and A uh, section, uh, and you can click there, and you may be able to uh, ask a question. Oh, so you clicked the wrong button. That's okay. We all do that. <laughs> so this morning for all of you, I conducted a 7 a.m. stakeholder needs analysis. So, um... It is 11 a.m. here, or 10.58, uh, so if I sound a little groggy, I am drinking an energy drink so we can rock and roll this meeting. So hopefully I don't sound too tired to you. I'll try not to be um, Ben Stein and Ferris Bueller's Day Off and monotone. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Oh no, D. This is an amazing new movie called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's our ID. If you get a chance, it's a good flick. I don't know how well it would fly these days for all the shenanigans that he pulled off in a day, but somehow he got away with it. Give another minute or two uh, just to make sure uh, we don't leave anyone out.
Hello, Brent. See, that's why I don't like to leap. I like to start exactly at eleven because there's always someone that has something going on that wants to join and doesn't want to feel like, hey, I'm left out here. So uh, we're down to thirty seconds, and I'll start to rock and roll. If you're able to, uh, in the Q&A, uh, if you'd like to tell me uh, where you're from uh, geographically and um, what you do, uh, what do you do? You don't have to necessarily give your job title, but what do you do uh, at work and for the organization or the agency that you work for? You can find the Q&A um, as a question bubble, and then you can uh, ask a question. Awesome. We got an Arizonian e-learning specialist. We have a Houston HR and training development. I was just in Texas. My neighbor um asked me to road trip from ohio to um uh close to austin and so we did that in 48 hours we were it took 18 hours to drive there um and we it took us two days and we knocked it out yeah it was a it was a long hike that's for sure anyone else want to share where they're from and Well, that's okay. Um, oh, we did get someone. Hey, Missouri. Woo, previous Dayton individual, instructional design. That's fantastic. Sorry that, well, congratulations and sorry. I don't know what Missouri's like, so I'm sure it's pretty nice, but um, uh, I have no idea. So um, for anybody that just came in, we were just in the Q&A popping in where you're from. Um, and what you do, you don't necessarily have to give your title and who you work for, but, um, you know, some people said I work in a medical industry, some said retail, um, things like that. And, um, just to give us another second or two and then we'll get, uh, rocking and rolling. And I was super bummed because I was hoping uh, my background music would play because I love playing film scores radio while I do these. It uh, sets a tone, but unfortunately, it doesn't play this music through my uh, through this desktop share. So I was quite bummed to find that out. Otherwise, you guys would be hearing epic music from like Star Wars and Rudy and uh, Fantasia and all kinds of cool stuff. If you get a chance to look at it, it's film scores radio on Pandora. And I'll kind of sneak that over for you guys to see. Here it is. Well, all right, everyone. Um, I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Andrew Hughes, uh, and I am the president of Designing Digitally. And what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is how to track and measure your employee training results. And the reason why is I find that there are many organizations that do run the ADDIE process, uh, but what they do is they do the ADDI, and evaluation's kind of left to either the organization or is just checked off if they completed it or not as an informational dump, rather than actually measuring business impact um, while solving the challenges, while pro providing the value back to the organization um, that training uh, does. And we have had a very long road of not really tracking this in detail. And so designing digitally actually uh, two years ago um, made a fundamental shift to ensuring that we provide that training results uh, quantitatively and qualitatively so that you actually are able to understand the uh, direct and indirect impact. And so what I'm going to be doing is going through a lot of that today. Uh, the first thing you should know, I just kind of gave you this, so I apologize 
apologize for uh, doing it without hitting the slide is um, this is our logo. If you want to check us out, you can see it designingdigitally.com. Um, and if you do want to interact with me, uh, I'll be flashing this at the end also. Uh, but this is a, a picture of me um, and uh, prior COVID. Uh, I look pretty much the same, except for I think I've gain more weight. <laughs> uh, but you can actually take your phone out right now if you'd like and um, just open up your camera. And when you highlight the QR code, it'll take you to LinkedIn and you can add me real quick if we're not already uh, LinkedIn buddies. And uh, I talked a little bit about what Designing Digitally does. Uh, we uh, basically have a three-tiered approach. Uh, we consult with you to identify not just the training goals, uh, but your business challenges and business needs, uh, developing out custom learning experiences, whether that's mobile, AR, VR, traditional uh, e-learning, or even blended learning experiences. Uh, and then we also um, support these over a long period of time. So we are not a company that just uh, uh, puts it out the door and says, see you later, good luck, have a uh, great time. So that gives you a little bit about us. What we're going to hit today is uh, things such as the importance of the evaluation, challenges, what are KPIs, how do we do an evaluation, what types of evaluations are out there um, that you can use, uh, different ways that uh, you can pin that, point that towards the impacts and the benchmarks and how we've actually done it. Uh, one thing I want to let you know is the fundamental goal of any workplace training is to give employees the skills and the knowledge they need to perform the best. But some of the training programs produce better results than others. So just because employees were taught doesn't mean they've actually learned or applied what they've learned in a way that we can actually see it happening. Uh, that's where training evaluation comes in, evaluating the processes and the training program benchmarking pre, uh, prior to today so that we can actually see what's um, actually happening. And I like to take um, some of the definition of what we obtained from the CDC. Um, so for all of you, uh, let's get vaccinated. If you're not, um, you know, please really consider it for me, a uh, friend to a friend. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, that the CDC has described is, you know, training evaluation is the process of collecting that systematically and providing that information to be able to improve. And then evaluation is the feedback mechanism uh, so that we can identify and collect that information. And it helps you make decisions about what we should do for, for future trainings. So this kind of gives you an understanding of what is the difference between uh, training evaluation and just evaluation. So with that said, my next question to you is actually a poll. Um, how many of you feel or think uh, your organization measures training this effectively? Do you think you, uh, what percentage of your companies do you think measure training uh, effectiveness? And you could be brutally honest, you know, um, how accountable are you for your training effectiveness? Because there's, there's multiple types of training. And I think I've spoken to about this before in prior um, uh, discussions. You know, there's what we consider to be employee improvement, and then there's um, employee information, you know, your informational modules where they just need the data um, because they need to know it or just remember it on a lower level of blooms, that works very well. But if you're actually training them to be really good welders, you're going to need um, a much more rigorous way of actually measuring that effectiveness. And uh, whether that's within the first 90 days, they must be able to fully weld a box, which actually is something that I'm learning to do myself. And I, that is one of the tests you have to be able to make a metal box and make it nice, which who knew? Um, so this kind of gives you uh, all the idea of what the results are so far. Um, like I said, since we're now just getting into the age of measurement, uh, I'm not surprised by that at all. But you guys can take a look at uh, some of that feedback. One of the things that we found is only 70% of the firms actually attempt to measure it. And one third state that they're being confident in actually using the right metrics. Uh, but what we find is uh, that a lot of times those metrics are uh, some of the um, lighter ones we'll be getting to, some of the uh, learner satisfaction, which is very important, but that doesn't tell you necessarily if it actually improved the business or it can be benchmarked uh, completely from learner satisfaction. So 
So what are we actually looking at? We really are looking at the importance of this and trailing evaluation. Uh, I love this meme, so I had to throw this in here. Sorry about that to our designers. They get mad at me when I throw pictures in here. You can see because I missed the line. Um, but why do we need to measure and evaluate uh, tra uh, employee training programs? So one thing that we're told as trainers is we always have to answer the why and figure out the why. Well, the things that you have to understand is we need to be able to impact the employee and productivity. Um, if we cannot do that, or there are challenges that are reducing productivity in some way, shape or form, uh, we do that by building skill development, just like you do in athletes. So we need to be able to make sure that we're making that employee impact um, through the productivity um, that they are putting out. Uh, we also need to make sure that we can determine if the training has any type of impact on the business performance. And so if so, if we're doing sales training, we need to know today, what is the failure rate? How is that happening? What is happening? Um, and really divulge into that before we even step into, oh, we need to make cross-selling training. Well, that's just because you think you need it doesn't mean that is the problem. Maybe it's um, you're prospecting completely wrong um, and going after the wrong buyers. We also have to discover what has diverted from the processes and the plans put in place prior. If if there's no plan, obviously we have to outline that. But a lot of times what I find uh, in different divisions and organizations is there was some type of documented plan, but things have diverted from that, maybe because of evolution of improvement or assumptions or um, just miscommunication or uh, companies get siloed and all of a sudden uh, things evolve in one place uh, rather than another. We also have to be able to identify business challenges. It's our job to train employees to improve business performance. Ultimately, we are there to make the employees better. That's what our job is. Yes, you could say they need to pass compliance because we need insurance. You can say, yes, they need to be able to know this. And yes, we have to have them onboarded. But ultimately, if you onboard somebody and after that 90 days, you find that they're still um, not up to performance, you're going to let them go because they are not living up to the business expectations to ensure that you're able to help solve and improve the business. So. Our job is to actually overall solve business challenges through innovative training. We also need to be able to make sure that we can quantitatively and qualitatively get feedback while suggesting creative training plans based on that feedback that we get. Uh, that way we can turn around and say, this is the data that we're finding. Uh, because what I find is we're constantly, I am in meetings uh, justifying to executive levels um, what this is going to do, why, how, and exactly um, what anticipated uh, outcomes that we are going to see that are quantifiable and qualifiable. If I can't provide that, they're not going to move forward with it. They, we also have the ability by doing this to make sure that if we're doing instructor-led training, if we're do, we have learners that are not um, uh, listening to our outbursts of, hey, you need to be able to complete this um, uh, training by this date, uh, what you can find is uh, by doing these evaluations, we can actually hold them accountable and it can be put as part of their quarterly evaluation, monthly evaluation, biweekly evaluation, whatever type of organization you are, division um, and uh, department you are in. One of the other things that we can do is knowledge retention. By doing these evaluations, we can um, then benchmark to knowledge retention. One of the great things that I had this morning is one of the comments was um, we consistently have this subset of people coming to us, asking us where to find this document and these um, files to fill out. And so one of the things that we're able to do is put a benchmark. How often does that happen? Um, I want you to track for the next 30 days. Uh, get back to me. Who came to you? What did they come to you for? Um, and we start that so that we can then say this is what is what happened today and then go uh, move forward. What does that mean? We have to be a detective. We have to be a sleuth. Um, we have to be able to do that and have some of that analysis uh, phase and and consulting phase and also detective phase to make sure that we have taken the time to really explore that. We also need to be able to look at learning curves. Uh, I, 
great example is the welding that I bring up. Uh, there are some people that uh, pick it up very quickly, some that do not. So we have to be able to benchmark them to their own performance. Luckily, we have now two technology tools such as XAPI um, and uh, LRSs uh, from various different companies, along with open source LRSs that you could install yourself to be able to track analytical data uh, that we should have had many years ago. Um, to, so how do we actually determine uh, the ROI uh, analytically? Well, there's a couple of things I'm going to be bringing up later on on how to do it. So what you will be able to do is to be able to say benchmark this to this and come back and continue to do that detective work uh, later on to really uh, prove the outcome uh, and justify uh, why uh, the expenditure for your training was worth it. One of the other things it'll do is we will find direct and indirect impacts benefi uh, benefiting this. And the reason why is we have found uh, quite a few of those just in uh, the work that we've done for companies. One of the things I say is uh, I can guarantee that when we're working on these projects with you, uh, if we're able to really benchmark and, and work on these uh, KPIs and work on uh, the analysis side, uh, we will be able to uh, gather intelligence that uh, is maybe outside of this could be used to improve the organization as a whole. And that actually happened today uh, on a different, whole different subtopic and situation. And it was pretty amazing to see because it clicked all of a sudden that we're discovering uh, uh, not just the one major crack, but um, cracks outside of that that can be tended to um, while doing this process. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, evaluation models and what types. But before I do, I want to tell you, um, here's what we're up against and the things that are happening if we're not actually going to be using that uh, evaluation model. Um, we do notice a lower employee job satisfaction and higher turnaround rates with organizations that um, have not evaluated, especially that onboarding. So you have your induction uh, prior or um, at the beginning when they first come in, walk in the door, you have your orientation um, that could lead from the first day to the 30, and then you have your onboarding, which is from uh, the induction all the way to uh, whenever uh, you set them free without supervision, whether that's your 90 day set, your six, uh, your 60, 90, 120, six months, however your organization has brought that uh, around. One of the things that we have seen is we've seen a bigger attrition rate and turnaround rate uh, when there isn't that type of planning and systematic structure in place. Uh, we do uh, miss out on new generation employees in that way, especially some of the all-stars coming out of the schools. Uh, we will stunt the workplace productivity and growth uh, because we're not able to really identify uh, where there's stop gaps, where there's miscommunication breakdown and holes. Um, and we may know and we may be uh, whistle blowing those internally that, hey, we, ha we are siloed too much. We're not having enough meetings this way. Um, but until you actually have some quantifiable data that's showing the impact, it's really hard to be able to justify uh, putting more meetings together and pulling people off the workflow uh, workspace you are going to end up losing some of the competitive advantage because uh, you're able to take data and analyze in a way that shows you what's happening and uh, what is the direct and indirect impact of that. So that gives you the ability to see what type of advantage you're going to be able to provide uh, compared to others. You will have a misuse of resources and money and funds. Uh, a great example is you, what I see is relationships are built with inside of the training realm. Um, you may be working for a Fortune 100 company. You may have a dozen uh, e-learning development vendors building for you. Um, but the question I ask quite often is, how do you really know if the ones that you are paying pennies to are really giving you a business impact compared to the ones that you are investing much more uh, with? And uh, nine times out of 10, uh, they do not know that. Um, they just want to uh, turn and burn, which is fine, but you're not training people. You're giving them information. One of the things you also see is the failure of engagement uh, because they don't have a track and they don't uh, see any effort to improve material. They just see more informational dump. And um, you will see more ununified skills and knowledge gaps going forward because you didn't have that rigor to improve any of that um, prior to the next set of individuals joining us. So what are some of the challenges of tracking some of these results? 
Um, before we do that, um, I want to know uh, what are some of the challenges that are often seen in training evaluation. And I do believe that this bad boy is a, um, no, it isn't. I'm sorry. I thought it was. Um, so these are lack of thorough planning. Take the liberty to plan a training module will save you time and money in the long run. Uh, I can tell you by churning and burning, you can do that. But if you're really going to want to uh, get justifiable resources for the following year, uh, estimate out a stronger budget, uh, be looked at in a stronger light by the executive side, uh, you will want to do this in detail. Uh, one of the other things that we see is you will be restricted on a budget. Nine times out of 10, the money goes to the advertising and um, goes to marketing right off the bat at the beginning of the fiscal year. From there, what is left over is usually what's invested to do uh, the analysis and to uh, be provided to HR. So a lot of times we're working with uh, much lower budgets than other uh, agencies or departments. Uh, but one of the things I can tell you uh, is that those are still strong enough to be able to really do some major impact with. And the more you show impact, the more it'll be pulled from other places that are not. Uh, one of the other things that we find is developing training for the wrong reasons. We actually um, uh, systematically state that you must, you must have a justifiable reason for this training. And that justifiable reading must be tied to something, whether that's um, a, it's got to be an actual need within the organization and not a want. So what does that mean? You come to me and want a VR experience because you think it's cool. That's great. But if we cannot benchmark it across to make an improvement within inside of your organization, then we're just having fun. We're not improving training. So one of the other things that we find is uh, applying ins inconsistent training uh, has been uh, something that we have seen across the board, especially with the virtual uh, instructor-led trainings that have come out lately. And the only reason why is we've had a lot of instructor-led tra trainers that were former um, you know, classroom trainers that really have struggled on the online side, bleh, struggled, sorry, uh, on the online side. And so uh, that has a, uh, diminished and affected our ability to input the same exact message uh, with training. So we want to make sure, and it also makes such a difficult ability for you to get ROI data from that training, uh, that you want to make sure that you have uh, standardization as much as possible. And we talked about this before, if you are going through not making those benchmarks, ignoring or at least hearing out some of the concerns from someone, uh, what you're going to find is uh, without backing and without justification, it's going to continue to grow and grow and snowball to the point where training might not be the most effective way of handling the situation at all. And one of the things that we also find is the experience with the trainer um, goes hand in hand with the delivery of the training. So if you have a boring instructor-led trainer, you're going to have a boring training. Uh, so make sure that you choose wisely on that side. And also limit the ability to analyze training evaluation data so that you can quantify it and qualify it. This way, uh, individuals can do their best to um, match it to the benchmarks and match it to everything else that we're doing. And make sure that you're not just doing the learner satisfaction surveys. You should be doing a pre-stakeholder survey, a pre-learner's expectation survey, the, the learner satisfaction survey, um, the stakeholder impact surveys, um, the post-mortem uh, impact surveys, uh, the business impact survey, the uh, return on equity survey, uh, and uh, really investigating all of that. Um, and so one of the things I want to ask you, uh, does your company track and measure the effectiveness of existing training programs? So a poll is up. Does your company track and measure the effectiveness of employee training programs currently? Do 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 Yay! I love the one that um, we do have um, some great feedback here. It 
So for all of you that voted, um, here are some of the results uh, across the board. It looks like some of you are and some of you are not. Um, and that's OK, because what I find is uh, it's all about uh, how much executives have valued um, the organization uh, in regards to knowledge transfer and um, employee performance. So we're going to talk about this lovely word KPIs that is now shoved down L&D's throat all the time. And it is a key performance indicator. They're basically benchmark set of uh, ways for us to be able to quantify the performance and growth. And this way, if you're able to set up KPIs uh, for specific um, benchmarks with the company that align to your specific goals, you're going to end up with a much uh, better outcome and you'll have a better understanding of the value that you bring. So what are the, some of the benefits? Um, they can identify issues in course content, delivery, um, interaction, um, user experience, especially with XAPI nowadays. One of the things I could tell you is it's great that we could track everything, but we don't need everything for XAPI. We need to make sure that they're hitting the competencies and um, uh, learning and utilizing the behaviors. Uh, and those types of things are what we want to track inside of the XAPI and how that is impacting so that we can cross-examine that. Uh, make sure that your uh, training is effective. It's personalized to any of the course based on any of the skills gap knowledge that you found. Uh, what we're doing for uh, the Department of Education right now is actually breaking up uh, a ton of different modules uh, based on the job role with inside of the K through 12 school system uh, across the United States. And those will be delivered at the beginning of the year. And so we are actually building courses based on the skills gaps and knowledge gaps of a school superintendent, school principal, uh, vice principal, uh, teacher, uh, guidance counselor, so on and so forth. Uh, make sure that you provide an explicit understanding of what is working well and what is did not work well, and you give a recommendation on how to actually replicate the success and reduce failures. Um, and that just isn't, well, we're going to train them on this. What is it that's going to happen in that training that's actually going to provide that or reduce that failure? So. A KPI actually helps to identify inefficiencies because you're actually able to say, this is where we are, this is uh, what we do, this is the average. Uh, you know, I have a KPI for our sales team. It takes 120 calls um, to be able to get a yes or a meeting, one meeting scheduled, 120 calls. So take into consideration that we, that is a KPI that we know based on experience and based on that. It's what we consider a point of reference. It may be an average. It may be a goal that is hit consistently. It may be a mean, but it is something that is a uh, hard data number. It can actually be used to train uh, and look at the effectiveness across multiple peer groups at the same time and across uh, different types of learners. Um, and we can then see inefficiencies or effectiveness on let's say specific scenarios over, I don't know, um, how to be an effective leader or how to handle a sales situation. Uh, we can see based on those groups and across that. And we can actually collect valuable information during and after the training with these KPIs um, by using things such as star ratings in our learner satisfaction um, or um, just a multiple choice sections um, in our learner satisfaction that can kind of help us uh, to better gauge what's actually happening rather than just uh, a thumbs up, thumb down or um, in your words types of experiences. So what are the best uh, KPIs for tracking, uh, for training effectiveness. Obviously, learner performance is something that we now can track with XAPI. Before we could know the quiz um, out of, you know, 10, you had with SCORM the ability to put 100 um, out of 100. Uh, you were able to do suspend data if you wanted to come back and see some a chart or something of that nature. But truthfully, um, for many years, we could just see who it was, when they took it, what grade they got out of 100, and if they passed it or completed it. Now we have the ability to see their performance. That means how quickly did they make a decision or which decision was made poorly over and over and over. 
um, we're actually able to see the training fulfillment percentage. You know, how much did they finish in particular courses uh, to identify whether learners actively engaged in the content. We can see if it's been active, if it hasn't been active. Um, we will be able to see, and like I was talking about, the participation satisfaction score and making that more quantitative um, and being able to use things like star rating. Um, if you're able to benchmark with some of the job skill acquisition, uh, we can see if they've actually increased by taking a simulation or uh, a uh, learning experience that allows them to actually do uh, the job skill. And we can also look at knowledge retention. Uh, yes, you can do exams and quizzes, but what we like to do is let it rest and then reheat it. So what does that mean? No, I'm not talking about your leftovers. I'm talking about we may not um, come back to this to do uh, some type of uh, remedial and retention uh, training for maybe a month or so and maybe a micro learning experience um, in, or in intervals, allowing for us to really see if this has been um, retained over time. And also looking at one of the most important pieces, the organizational performance metrics. How um, are the executives going to be benchmarking our or, um, division? And how are we going to meet any of the needs for them? And our net promoter store. This is the overall customer satisfaction. And so this is something that we use in business all the time. The net promoter score allows customers to rate how likely they are to suggest or recommend your organization. Um, it's usually out of one out of 10. And uh, with training out evaluation, you can see if this net promoter score uh, ha can be impacted at all to see if employees completed training uh, requirements. So you can actually go out and look at your organization's net promoter score today. Uh, and if you're running something on customer satisfaction, uh, you can come back and say, you know, we've seen an increase in our net promoter score six months later. Um, this may not be a direct, but it may be an indirect impact. Another thing that we talked about is making sure you have the seal of approval from the executives. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be able to really observe uh, knowledge transfer along with the managers or any of the other stakeholders that are involved. Um, and they will be responsible really for basically benchmarking you. So knowing how they, the, you are going to be benchmarked will allow you to actually uh, get a better grasp on what is important and how those KPIs impact not just this program, but you your department, your job, so on and so forth. Now that we've looked about the training evaluations, um, I wanna talk about uh, conducting some of them. First off, I wanna talk a little bit about what does it take to do a KPI, okay? The first thing we're gonna actually do is assess. We're gonna take a look, it's just like the ADI process. Uh, we're actually gonna assess and really we uh, work with the executives and the individuals that have the data to uh, get uh, numbers from them. Even if we don't have them, approximates and based on something that you can uh, stick a fork in. Uh, we're gonna look at what we can do for a change strategy and uh, being able to see what type of improvement uh, we wanna see in the performance. And then we're gonna figure out what we're gonna to do to actually evaluate that. So what type of rubric are you going to be handing the executives to say, this is how we evaluated this program to say, this is what we did. And we're gonna get into evaluation strategies here in just a minute. And then from there, you have to be able to create dashboards, scorecards, um, and be able to visually understand what you're looking at for data. And then you also need to be able to uh, make sure at the root level, you've track and set these relevant KPIs and you track them from the company, the business unit, and in my opinion, from your L&D side also. So I talked about these really quick. Make sure you assess those training programs. Make sure you really look at smart KPIs. What is smart KPIs? It needs to be a KPI that is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So again, the smart for smart KPIs is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. This will help you going into creating a KPI with uh, an executive or with inside of uh, your department. Um, if you can do that, if you can set a goal like that and set that measurable piece, you will be able to see if you can attain it or not. 
one of the things that you will find is if you can help companies adjust to particular aspects of training uh, with that, they can align the results that you're really looking for with the business results. And that way you have a side-by-side -side comparison. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, choosing the right evaluation model. Um, there is the Kirkpatrick model, but I'm going to also uh, let you in on a couple other models um, that um, are piggybacked off the Kirkpatrick model here in just a second. But before that, the one thing that we also have to understand is we are now in the age of instant gratification. We are used to getting feedback immediately from people. So that means we are now at a point where you must consistently ask individuals for feedback more than you have before. So what happens? You did a learner satisfaction survey. That's fantastic. You should be looking at a 30-day survey afterwards. How much of this material do you remember? And um, not necessarily an assessment, but asking them, what do you remember? What don't you remember? Which they're not going to be able to answer that, but you know what I mean? What what wasn't intriguing? What um, would you like to know more about? Things that can uh, get a little bit more in depth from just your satisfaction survey. So before we move into this, we're going to talk uh, in different ways to evaluate training and impact, but I have a question for you all. Does your company utilize any models for evaluation currently? So there's the Kirkpatrick model, the Kaufman, the formative and summative, the Phillips ROI methodology, the Anderson model, and the CIRO model, which we're going to be talking about all of these. You may not know some of these. You may know them all. But do you use any of those uh, models currently? Yeah, we have a few answers. Yay! I am not surprised by these results at all. Um, but one of the things that is the big winner on this is the Kirkpatrick model, um, which is a industry standard model for evaluating training. And we'll be talking about that, obviously. So uh, one of the first that we all have heard about is the Kirkpatrick model. Uh, it actually has uh, four levels to it. The level one is reaction, um, which the degree of participants found training to be favorable, engaging. The next one is learning. Um, did they acquire the information? Did they, do they ha now have the skills and the aptitude to do the job? The third level is behavior. Did they apply what they learned during the training when they were back into the job? And did we see any type of behavior change? And then the level four on the Kirkpatrick model is the results. This is to the degree of which uh, the outcome that we were looking for, KPI, uh, did we hit that or not? And is there any way we can actually look the accountability on that? Uh, so that uh, kind of breaks down the Kirkpatrick model while we have other models. Now, this is a little bit different. The Kaufman's five levels of evaluation has added one. Um, and what it has done is the Kaufman has taken the Kirkpatrick model and it's split level one into two sections, input and prof, uh, process. So that fifth level is actually geared towards a little bit more of the evaluation on how the training enhances um, customer and societal satisfaction. And it's really uh, set up in five uh, steps. The initial investment and in how learners are reaching to the training, the training benefits for individuals or small groups, then the practical impact of the training on the employee, and then the benefits just like the Kirkpatrick. And then from there, uh, whether your employee training adds value to the company culture or society at a large. So looking at this, Kaufman was really looking at organizational uh, evolution, and that's a lot of the evaluation. So if you're doing diversity inclusion, um, you're doing, um, you know, to tell you societal rules, something of that nature, you can use the five levels of Kaufman's, um, and it's a piggyback off of Kirkpatrick. Now, some of you said that you were using uh, formative and summative evaluation methods, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, okay? Uh, the formative model helps improve training programs while uh, still in development stage, 
why the summative evaluation in turn is used a post training and provides data on the training efficiency. So looking at the formative evaluation model, um, you'll create a feedback loop that's based on learning objectives, tools and needed and other design uh, outcomes that are desirable for the example. The feedback loop might look like this. You set up an objective, you do a visual design, you evaluate that, you implement content, you deliver it, you evaluate it, you then do additional uh, evaluation and design activities to it. Then you conduct an assessment and then you go back to evaluation and then you come back into visual design. So uh, it's a much different process than let's say the added process. Um, but what we find is this is a lot of what we're talking about for agile methodologies or SAM, things like that. It's the formative evaluation metal method. Um, the summative is a lot of what you see with the ADI process. It takes place after uh, you've in essence, built everything, implemented it, and they've taken it. And now what you're doing is evaluating the effectiveness of, of this, both um, uh, learner satisfaction uh, and also um, uh, the impact evaluation. And there's another one uh, similar to Kirkpatrick. There's the Phillips ROI method. It has five levels of evaluation. Um, it actually, uh, you will evaluate the employee learner action and their satisfaction within the course, but then the learning stage determines how successful students were in gaining new skills and knowledge. And then the third is actually to assess and implement stage while you gauge whether the workplace correctly implemented the training and if it's actually um, effective right there with implementation. And then from stage four is to measure the business imp impacts. And finally, you compare the business outcomes to the training costs to calculate your ROI. So we're actually turning around in uh, showing the cost occurred and uh, what impact that um, has had. Uh, which is a little different than what Kirkpatrick model has done in the past, where we um, are more on the learning side of the Kirkpatrick model, while the Phillips ROI provides more of a blended between the um, business and uh, the uh, learning side. There's also the Anderson model. There's only three stages to this one, okay? The model's main priority is to ensure results align to your business strategy period. As such as the first stage looks at existing training programs and determines whether they're in line with the existing business strategies provided by executives or and outcomes of those right off the bat. So they basically do a catalog evaluation of everything that you have. The second stage detects on how your training has contributed to the prior strategic results of the organization. And then finally, the third final stage is to dictate whether the results of the ROI are worth the initial training investment to build it or maintain it. And then it'll be compiled with the data gathered in the second stage. This is where you can truly see whether you have made an ROI or an impact to um, the business side. And so the Anderson model is something that the executives would apply, but it's something you would actually wanna look at to really see how effective am I and how well do I produce? And then, the CIR model, um, it means context, input, reaction, output. This is a method of evaluating is more appropriate for employees working at higher levels within your organization. Um, this is because it doesn't take learner behavior into account at all. And it's directed more towards self learners who are keen in advancing their skills and knowledge. Um, so it looks at just context, input, reaction, and output, but not uh, learner satisfaction. So the reaction is what actually happened uh, with these employees from an evaluation standpoint, not um, the reaction the employees had of the training. Uh, and it completely disregards all of that, just strictly looking at um, the hard numbers of that context, input, reaction, and output. So how do we actually do it here to designing digitally? One of the things I could tell you is uh, we actually do all of those evaluation methods. Um, we measure, evaluate, and really dive into figuring out exactly what you guys are looking for from the project um, beginning. And that may be just, we have this challenge. Many of the organizations come to us say, we have this challenge. Uh, we also have a lot of organizations come to us and say, we already have an in-house team, but this is something that we wanna bite into, but maybe a little larger than what we could take on. Um, and we also have many that we don't, 
we don't know how to solve this challenge. Can your team help us? And how do we do that? We do that through a project lifecycle journey. And that project lifecycle journey is uh, a six main steps that allow us to align with our clients. And it's for us to discover what you um, are aiming to do, uh, make determinations with you, design out those aspects, uh, develop out those uh, tools and deliver those. And then the biggest one is our dedicate phase. Our dedicate phase is the E, but on steroids. And I'll be talking about that in a second. E out of the added process for evaluation. Um, so if you are to work with us, this is a much different uh, process. We do not produce this, upload this in your LMS, have a post-mortem uh, and walk away. Uh, what we do is we serve the tools that we develop um, so that you can move on and make uh, educated decisions while we provide that education back to you. So what does that mean? Um, during the send steps, we have a sustainment and support agreement. We have a 90 day warranty for anything that we build. You get the raw files afterwards, but we are gathering metrics and KPI data throughout both uh, uh, at the beginning, through the life cycle of the project and through the life cycle of the project being uh, delivered. Uh, we're also measuring and reporting those results back to you uh, and analyzing any gap, analyzing and identifying training gaps for you and providing those in reports, along with uh, providing you suggestions and uh, training plans and uh, anticipated budgeting for those training plans and any tr additional training needs that have been identified uh, based on any of the analytical data. And then we also, within that, evolve and revise the content and the material that's built because we strongly believe that uh, putting it up into your LMS and allowing it to collect pixel dust is not an effective way to train athletes and is certainly not a way to effective way to train employees. And then one of the things that you see is technology requirements change and evolve. We actually uphold those um, by uh, continuing to help you ensure that any tools that are made internally for with inside of your systems, inside of your LMS, or even mobile apps are working effectively um, throughout the life cycle of them running. And that 10 step phase really has allowed us to uh, stay with our customers and help them uh, through long, long term growth. So one of the next steps now that we've kind of talked about what are the models, what can we do, how can we do it, so on and so forth. One of the things that we'll be doing here from Designing Digitally was we're actually going to be providing you resources um, and a meeting to be scheduled if you guys would like to talk more about uh, each one of those KPIs and how you can kind of determine that KPI and how you can determine benchmarks and how you can approach executives with benchmarks and um, how you can uh, get help getting your voice heard or justifying your budgets or anything of that nature. Uh, we can help you with all of that. So, you know, at any time, Time, we'll be able to provide that. So you'll be getting a uh, email with us and some resources along with a scheduled meeting link for uh, anyone to be able to uh, have that conversation with us. So one uh, last thing that I do want to do um, before we uh, move on is I would like to know if you could rate this webinar for me. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, me explaining the types of models, um, the way to be able to do it, the reasons why and not. Um, and uh, you guys know how this will work. So we've all done star ratings. So if you could take a moment uh, to do a star rating vote, um, we will uh, from there, I will go to the next slide while you guys are doing that. Because if you would like to connect with us, um, you can do so uh, by taking a look at this other QR code that'll take you to our website. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, shoot me an email at sales at designingdigitally.com or give me a call at 513-698-8142. Uh, one of the things that I think many of us may know is if you give us a call, you can um, uh, choose an extension because we went from 90% in-house to 90% virtual uh, post-COVID. So uh, we are um, all over the place. And so uh, give us a call and we can certainly help your organization with any of this analytical work along with any um, future training needs. So with that said, I just want to say thank you guys so very much. I appreciate your time today. And if you have any additional questions for me, um, you can go ahead and add them to um, the Q&A section. And um, without any further ado, 
um, we are completed for today. So I give you guys about 10 minutes back of your lives. Hopefully you can check social media and uh, enjoy some cat videos on YouTube. So thank you guys and have a creative day.